Welcome back to the show. Today's going to be all about scents. Going to be all about cover scents, why we use it, why we use the wind, the thermals, all of that we're going to cover today and much more. What is that smell? You smell that? Stick around. It's going to be good. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Academy. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkGrows.com with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and elk hunting coach, Joe Gillian. You want to hunt elk, and they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Welcome back to the show. I'm the host, Gilbert Ornelas, here in the house. We got with us in New Mexico, live and in person, the guy, Joe Gillia and Leroy Chav Chavez. Welcome to the show tonight, guys. Hey, man. How hey, are man. you doing? Tonight. Fantastic. Tonight's going to be all about scent. And uh, I know you guys got it teed up for us. We're going to hit it deep and talk about scent and everything that goes along with that. Joe, I know you got a a whole plethora of things to talk about. So we're going we're gonna to talk to you about what, you know, what's important directions and everything else. So uh, I'm going to kind of turn it over to you and let you run with the ball, Joe. So um, I think most people want to know how important the wind is when you're hunting elk. And guys, there are three senses. You've got the eyes, you got the ears and you got the nose. And let me tell you what, you can you can get by the eyes, you can get by the ears, but you're not going to get by the nose. Uh, elk, scent is number one. And you just think about when you smell the nastiest smell you've ever smelled in your life and you multiply that by a thousand that's how they're picking up your scent out there in the woods. It's it is the most critical thing. Like hunting with RC Knox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like RC Knox, man. Uh, That's the inside <laughs> joke, people. <laughs> when you're uh, when you, when you're comparing their vision uh, and and sound, you know the thing about an elk, they've got great vision. But in fact, their vision's not anything like ours. If if you can see their eyeball, they can see you. I mean, it's over 180 degrees on there that they can see. So they have a large field of view and they've got great ears. You know, uh, I tell people when I go in, uh, I'm buying new camo. I like to take that camo and I like to rub the arms together or rub the legs together and see if it makes any kind of a, a swishing noise. And if it is, and it does, I guarantee you, if you're hearing it, that animals, I mean, it's really coming off to them. So they have great vision. Um, they have great ears. And, but you can fool those. You can get by those. That, uh, that's part of their, their weakness. But you are not going to get by that nose. If you're out there and you have an animal coming into you and you see that nose start going up in the air. Yep, you're in trouble. It's over. <laughs> so uh, that's one thing in, in elk hunting is if you are not working the wind, if you do not understand that concept and – you get out there, you're going to have a, a difficult time setting up on an animal. You've got to really, you know, if it's going to take you a half hour to change things and to loop around and try something different, you had better do it because it's going to mean the difference between you getting a shot and you watching that butt end head off through the woods. You know, Joe, that's a, it's a, uh, it's paramount. I, you know, I've hunted a lot of different animals all over the world. And uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I can get by sometimes with whitetails and stuff, quartering wind and stuff like that. They're, they're more curious animal than an elk. But I'm going to tell you, when you're hunting an elk, I remember one afternoon, R.C. Knox and I were hunting in on a big, big herd bull with about 25 cows. 
and we got within about 125 yards of him, had the wind the whole time. And, I mean, we're giggling. We're fixing to get in there, get me within 60 yards of him, and that bull's in big trouble, right? I mean, he's in real big trouble. And I can remember us easing out of that black timber and getting down towards the bull, and all of a sudden – we feel the little gust from the gods, right? <laughs> from the back of us. Yeah. RC stops. And he turns around and looks at me and he's like, oh no. And I'll never forget it. There was a lone cow, the head lead cow, sitting in the middle of that uh that park. And she lifted her head up and stuck her head in the air and she never even looked in our direction. Right. She took <laughs> off like somebody <laughs> shot her out of a cannon and all 40 elk went with her, man. And I'm like, I looked at RC and I'm like, what in the world? He goes, man, he goes, it's just one of those deals that wind switched on us and went down there and got us. And so I learned immediately that, you don't see elk if you're not going to play the wind because they've done smelled you and gone, right? No right. wonder there are no elk there. You're not using the wind. So right. the number one most important thing in the world is the wind, right? Yeah, that's exactly me, right. I don't give a dang what you put on, what you roll around in. You don't use the wind, man. They're going to get you. Yeah, and we're going to talk more about that on, on some of those areas. Uh, and I'm just going to take a moment here for those people that are listening in. Uh, if you're hearing a little bit of delay here every now and then between me and Gilbert, uh, we have uh, – he's in Houston and we're in New Mexico, and, and it seems like we have about a five-second delay every now and then. So y'all be patient with us. Uh, uh, we apologize for that, but we still want to give you a good show and, 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 and discuss this stuff. So we're going to get it discussed. But you're absolutely right, Gilbert. Uh, if you're not playing the win, buddy, um, then – you're not going to see animals. And sometimes, you know, some guys, they'll be like, you know, that bull came into me and I could swear that wind was going right to him and he never even smelled it. But there's other, there's other things that play at that time. I mean, just because the wind is blowing on the back of your neck doesn't mean that 30 yards away that that wind is going straight towards that am, animal. And if you're on the side yeah, of a hill yeah, – no and it's cool weather and your thermals are, are going down and that wind is just barely blowing and, it's, and it starts to blow down near him, he might miss that, that scent trail. So there are times when it seems to kind of defy what we're talking can, can about. Can you talk about the thermals? Yeah, you betcha. You. So yeah, the, the, you, here's the best way that – thermals are, how elk use the thermals? Yeah, you bet. And the best way I can describe – thermals to people is if if you've ever been to a concert or you've ever watched uh the voice on tv or or you've seen uh, somebody do a, a halloween thing with all that smoke and fog you notice when that stuff comes out it doesn't go up in the air it stays on the floor and it stays rolling in the mm -hmm. direction that it's being blown out it's it's a it's a cool air coming out of that and, and constant What's that? And it's very constant. Yeah, and it's very constant. Uh, depending on the time of day. If you've ever done dry ice and you've put dry ice into a bowl of water and you've seen that fog come out over that bowl and it, fall, and it falls over the sides, almost just like uh, water, and it starts rolling down and off the counter and stuff, well, that's a thermal. That's the best way I could describe it to you, but the thermal is invisible cool air falls you know uh a balloon is another way to describe that a hot air balloon Warm air if you've, right if you've ever seen uh a hot air balloon it's on the ground till they just add a little bit of heat to that air and it starts going up so you know uh, i'm sitting here in the second story of a house and there's about 10 degrees difference from upstairs to downstairs because that cool air goes down to the bottom that's a thermal and there's natural thermals happening out there in the hills happening in the mountains it depends on how much elevation you have as to what it does but that still your scent gets in that cool air and it's down and it's flowing it's just creating if there's no wind it's creating a pool around you and it's kind of rolling out if if there's a downhill then that pool of scent starts to fall downhill. 
if there's any kind of breeze going, that breeze is going to carry it even more. So I, I guess the best way for me to describe and for people to think about is your body's kind of like that dry ice and it has that cloud coming off of it, hitting the ground and rolling out. And that is your scent pool and it'll just keep falling downhill. And if there's a breeze, it'll get caught inside that breeze and it'll, it'll take it. So elk, they, you, you think about an elk's life, what their goals are and what they're trying to do. Well, if it's not the rut, um, they're not thinking about breeding. If it's the rut, that's number one. If, uh, their priorities are they got to have food, they have to have water, and they got to have safety. They, from day to night, and then from night to morning, their number one goal is survival. Number one goal. And so what they do is they put place themselves during the different times of a day in a position where they have optimum opportunity for survival. So if you think about a hillside during the day when the air is heating up, that air is rising as it gets warm. And so that air is going up the side of a hill. So what that elk does is he moves in the morning while the thermals are still coming down, they're moving up so that they can have those thermals in their face and they're going up and they get about two thirds away, sometimes just a hundred yards down from the top of a ridge. And that's where they want to bed because now as they're going up, those thermals have changed and anything down below them, it's going to bring that scent right up to them. So they're going to smell you a long time before they see you and before they hear you. Uh, they can shoot, they can smell you from, if they get the right thermals and they get the right winds, they can smell you from a half mile away, okay? Uh, in the, For sure. In the evening, it's doing just the opposite. You know, they know that that air is getting ready to cool down, so they start heading downhill into that scent as they're going downhill. And now as the sun's going down and that air starts to cool, now you have those thermals coming downhill. So where they're going to bed is they're going to bed out there in those parks, and those open areas down at the bottom now of those drainages so that they have sense of anything above them in the trees coming down to them and warning them. Plus, they like to be in a little more open area because it helps them at night to see something. They can feed there. They can get their water, but they can smell danger coming to them. So that's how you want to think about thermals with the elk. That's why you are hear them in the morning coming up a ridge and you're going to hear them coming down in the evening. So you got to think about that. Right. I don't know how many times. As, for Go ahead. Sure, as, a, as a fantastic analogy, especially with the ice in the bowl, you know, the dry ice in the bowl and it flowing out. That's, you know, I couldn't explain it any better. That's, that's real easy for, you know, everybody to understand. And it's imperative for us to, to be able to use the wind. So, Joe, when you when you talk about using the thermals, you know, there's really not a way to beat elk's nose, if you ask me, but other than using the wind properly. But let's talk about that. Do you have some ways that you feel like you can beat their noses? You're not going to beat their nose, period, end of discussion. But you can mitigate it in some ways. You can um, – uh, I've heard people say basically you could muddy the water a little bit and confuse the animal. Um, or, you know, like we talk about use areas versus backcountry areas, some, in some of those use areas where they, they come in contact with humans mm -hmm. more often, uh, they're going to, it's kind of like this. Here's the way I explain this. If you and me, Gilbert, we were walking through the woods and we heard a rifle shot go off a mile away. We're like, oh, do you hear that mi rifle shot? You know, yeah, it's not no biggie. But if we hear a rifle shot go off 50 yards from us, we're friggin' hitting the ground, man. I mean, it's like, what the heck, you know? Mm -hmm. 
And that's kind of the way right. I, I think about it with elk, especially in use areas. They're, they're smelling humans all the time. But by the intensity of that odor of your scent, it's kind of like the same thing. If they're barely smelling something, they know it's the, the that danger's a long ways off. But man, if if yeah. they get a snout full of you from from twenty or thirty yards, uh, they're out of there. Yeah, if you're going up a hill and the thermals are going towards them, uh, they'll smell you. But uh, you know they're not really on high alert. But if if it gets a little bit more intense, then all of a sudden their ears and eyes are focused. And as soon as you get into their danger zone, they're gone. Yeah. And, and again, now remember, we're talking about use areas. And I, and I still say that animals in a use area act differently than backcountry areas. I, I think some of those places where they just don't have those, where they hear, see, and, and deal with sense of humans all the time, I think you can booger an animal out from half mile, three quarters of a mile away if they, if they catch your scent. They're going to move where they're from over to a drainage where they're not yeah. smelling that. But yeah. what I have found with these animals is a lot of times if they're coming up a hill and, and, and they're determined to go to a bedding area or they have a location they're going and they catch your scent where you're still a half mile away, well, they're going to veer kind of or, or keep a lookout for you and they're going to go around you and they're going to get where they want to go. But if they catch a snoot of you, you know, 50 yards, 100 yards, 200 yards, that's a whole different, they're turning and they're going. They're not even going to deal with it. So, yeah, you're, you're not going to beat their nose. That ain't going to happen. Well, what about cover scents, Joe? What about scent killers? So, all right. Um, cover scents, my thing is, is I do not like to use cover scents. If I'm going to do anything, uh, I want to smell like nothing at all. That's my preference because I feel like if I'm throwing on a cover scent, uh, a skunk scent or, you know, one of those things like that, and, and I, I just don't like those uh, store-bought cow urines and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> now if a skunk, if a skunk sprays, it's something's alarmed him, you know, so um, animals know that. I mean, they just, that's a bred into them. They don't want to be around where a skunk's been spraying something. There was danger there. Yeah. There's an alarm set off. When yeah. That happened. Look, I, I've been in the deer woods and, and seen the same thing. They hit that skunk smell and boom, man, they blow up like somebody shot them out of a cannon. And uh, so I don't use the skunk stuff at all. I, for me, if I'm around cattle, I'm stepping in every ca fresh cow chip that's out there. They <laughs> yeah, cows right. all the time, right? Or fresh elk crap and fresh right. elk bee, you know. That's right. kind of what, that's my best cover scent. Well, you know, and, and you brought up a good point because when I'm out there, I really like to take those uh, – those Douglas fir pines, man, that, you know, and, and I'll rub them on my shoulders and, and sure. on my underarms and stuff like that. And, uh, I'll get some of that natural scent and, and I'm notorious for rolling in a, in, in elk urine. But the only problem with that is if you're somebody that, that, uh, hunts with your nose, like I do, it, it can confuse things sometimes because you're always smelling sure. elk, you know, sure. It makes it a little more sure. difficult. Yeah, I think you could, yeah. uh, as Joe mentioned, you can reverse it too as far as scent. Uh, there's been many times where we've scented the elk. Yeah, you know, absolutely. They, they give a definite scent, and uh, that's a, a way to locate them. Right. So, In right. fact, yeah, uh, you turn into the wind, and you can really get after them. You know, yeah. you can smell it. Yeah, and, and you know, they're, they're strong, and it, uh, you know, it, it works both ways on that. Our nose isn't as good as theirs, but I think they, well, I'm going to say I think they smell a lot worse than me, but I imagine when they smell <laughs> me, they're kind of like, wow, <laughs> you know, how that goes. Brute by Fabergé. <laughs> That's yeah. Manano, dude. Brute <laughs> yeah. by Fabergé. That guy smells like a daggum French French, uh, <laughs> you almost to, went there. To be PC, man. <laughs> well, we know where you were going with that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that guy, he pulled his clothes out of his car and he smells like, I'm like, dude, what did you, what did you put on? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that's exactly right, man. <laughs> so his, his, his good cover sand and his, uh, and his, uh, dead gum, uh, 
shower curtains he wears. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so I'm not a fan of cover scents, but I think scent killers, uh, again, are, are a little bit different. And there's a lot of types of scent killers out there. And, and I'll just tell you this. Me personally, um, I want to make sure I'm as scent-free as possible. If my wind is going towards the elk, is, is he going to smell me? Yes. I'm not going to fool him. But, again, think about that distance factor. If I'm For able sure. to keep my scent as low as possible, I might get that animal another 10 yards closer, another mm -hmm. 3 yards closer. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to muddy the waters there a little bit and Before mitigate. Before goes on full alert. Yep. Exactly. I'm trying to mitigate that issue and – and it at least give me uh, any kind of advantage I can. I yeah, know if he gets a direct snoot, it's, it's blown over. So there's a lot of sprays out there that are carbon sprays that you can spray on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's even, uh, my wife bought me as a Christmas gift, she bought me one of those ozone bags. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what? I had a hard time with that because – after I put my clothes in and came out, they have, they have a smell to it. It's almost For like. sure. It's an ozone smell. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Kind of a little bit. Uh, Sweet kind of smell to them. Yeah. I don't know if it's a, like a, I don't, I don't know what to describe it as, but. <laughs> no, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. The uh, infamous Bruce Gaynor hunted with me deer hunting this year. Uh -huh. and he's got an ozonics. Right. And, That's uh, what I had an ozonics bag. And look, he put that Ozonics in that blind with us, me and him. And we hunted in a blind and we had a front come in on us and it switched our wind. And uh, I'm telling you right now, Joe, that thing smells. When it, when it turn it on, it's right. putting out something. Okay. Right. Because okay? you can smell it. It's like right. a sweet, I don't, I don't know, but we had deer within eight <laughs> yards of us and the wind's hitting us in the back and it's going right to them and they never alerted on us, us at all. So I was very impressed with the Ozonics unit sitting in a ground blind with it working. I'm unbelievably impressed. Well, that would have never happened. That would have never happened <clears throat> had we had not had it. I can tell you that these deer are wild and they don't smell humans. And if they do, they're in another County. Right. Right. So right. It was pretty impressive. You know, the, the thing about uh, the best way I describe those Ozonics is, you know, most people don't experience this, but remember when we were kids and your mom used to hang your wash out to dry? Yep. And the, when you would go and smell your clothes after they've been hanging to dry, well, think about that smell intensified about, and that's what it seemed, just like an intensified smell of that like 50 times to me. Like but an airy it, smell? Yeah, it yes. has just it, just a real... Hmm. Um, Gosh, I, I and it's not ammonia. It's not that, but there's no, there's. It's a different smell. It's yeah. It's, uh, so it's clean and it's it's uh, it's, it's different. And, and I'm telling you, what it does is it encapsulates the it encapsulates the molecules of your scent and it coats it to where when it comes out, it's not it's not alerting the animal. It's it's very odd. So that's the technology idea behind it, but. Um, I, I will tell you this, I do know of, I've done a lot of research on, on the tests done with uh, like Ozonics and those ozone and, you know, done with, uh, with dogs, with canine units and stuff like that. And what they found from it was that the dogs who would hit on a, a person within, you know, they put people, they have four boxes and they put a person in one box and they do something and where he would hit on a person in like 10 seconds that was just in regular street clothes and stuff like that. Um, they did different things with scent killers and sprays or washes and how they clean right. on their clothes. And, and they were able to disturb that dog being able or slow down that dog being able to scent a human just with those types of products, you know, probably 19 or 20 seconds. But they found with, with the ozone product, they were able to muddy that up a little bit for about 40 seconds on mm -hmm. that. So it did disturb the animal's ability to pick up those scents. Now, I caution people, though, because I, I want you to think about this. That dog is trained to pick up a human, right? 
So, well, look, dogs smell in parts per billion. Okay, right, just uh, like back, that elk. Yeah, back when back when I worked in the sheriff department, you know, our dogs. There were only two things in the state of Texas that were irrefutable in a court of law. One was the dog's nose, and the two was the horizontal gaze nystagmus test. Those are the only two things that you can't beat, right? Right. If they hit on it, it's there. Right. right. So at the end of the day, you didn't even need a warrant when they hit on it. I mean, it was a hundred percent inaccurate. So well, yeah, the, I, I get what you're saying. The point I want to make with that though is it's it's real important is that a dog is trained to pick up a scent. Okay. An elk is alerted by any scent different than their environment. Exactly. So exactly. the the difference being that, you know, that animal might have had a hard time picking up that scent that they are trained to pick up. But True. that elk out there, they catch a smell of something that's different. out of line. Yep. And they're gone. You well, know? you know, it's like when you walk in your house and your wife's been frying bacon. Right. Dude, that is a smell that, I mean, when you walk in there, bang, wow. <laughs> it's the same thing when elk walks in and they ain't smelled bacon in a long while, right? right. They ain't smelled you in a long while. They've been walking around out there since, you know, January with no scent in the woods. And then all of a sudden September rolls around and man, what in the heck is that? Right. Right. We're back. They're back. Yeah, no, exactly. That's so. exactly right. So that's just thing, you know, I, I want people to understand that all of these products or, as much as you're doing things like uh, we were talking in our last, last podcast, we just did uh, part two of uh, the hunt breakdown series, 2018. And we were talking about hygiene and about how we like to shower and camp. And I know that there's people out there that they don't worry about their scent. And there's people that wear Fabergé and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, out there. Right. But, but, my uh, <laughs> <laughs> but myself, it's critical to me to, again, give myself as much edge as uh, possible, okay? For sure. So, for sure. Uh, you know, that's why, you know, it used to be we used baking soda before they started making all these products, and, and baking yeah. soda was, was something that we used. And, and for those people out there, you know, for our blue-collar people out there, um, if you haven't put the green goop on your list to get that that uh, hunter soap, or if uh, you haven't got yeah. that stuff to wash your clothes in, baking soda sure. is very inexpensive and it works great. But like we said in our last podcast, you, you can put it in your hair, you can put it on your body. It doesn't make your hair feel good, but uh, you can put it on you and it it will uh, mitigate those that scent. It it breaks down those molecules and. And it helps you out that way. Um, it's great for washing your clothes. But I, again, warn people that if you go to put that anywhere down in your britches and it's a hot hunt, <laughs> you could be causing yourself some trouble. So you got to be real careful. Ouch. You got to be real careful. Yeah, you know, I, it, the cheap, this elk, you know, the new scents that are scent soaps and stuff like that from HS scents and tanks and everybody else that's out there now. Uh, uh, I forget there's several different brands out there, but they all work really well. Right. And, and the litmus test for me is I, I do a lot of fishing and when you're cleaning fish and everything, when you get done and you your can, hands, right. Yeah. You can smell like fish. So Tinks makes a spray. That's a golden spray that I really like. Yeah. I can spray that on my hands and rub them together. And that fish stink is gone, brother. That stuff works. Right. So I, and, and it works and it holds scent off of your fabric and everything for up to five to 10 days, you know? So it's a big thing for being in elk country. A lot of times in the morning, it's really cold, but you know, fat boys like me, we're going to sweat. So when we <laughs> perspire, we're going to stink. Right. So when I can spray that thing down and let them sit out in the, in the open, that really makes, I think, I, I feel like it helps us a lot, Joe. Well, and that's another reason for the shower. Right. Right. And I think this, sure. this is the time of year where all those scents, all those soaps, they're on yeah. sale. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. Go, 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 go and buy them. Yeah. Go and buy them now. Yeah, after sure. after Christmas is over and stuff, you know, that's a great time to go in and everything, you know, is is, is on a real clearance sale. That's the best time to buy those. But what what I was going to say about the showering and stuff like that as well is 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 uh odor is caused by bacteria. So right. the the cleaner you keep yourself, 
you know, the less you're going to stink. And if you haven't uh, ever been around uh, uh, a scout camp of guys that have been out there hiking out without a shower for, <laughs> for eight to 10 days, yeah, you know, yeah, we, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we have the Philmont scout ranch here in Cimarron and scouts are out there for nine, 11 days in a row. And when they get back to town, whew, yeah, you can smell them all away. Yeah, but no. I did it. But I, did, I do have an observation that you guys might enlighten me. I noticed that the, the only time that scent doesn't seem to be a, a, a problem is right after a rainfall or during a slight drizzle. This past hunt, I, I, I went with uh, uh, Mr. Kistler, and we, yes. were, we were in a, a, not a downpour, but it was raining steady, and the wind was blowing right down our backs. And we came upon a couple of uh, bulls that were, oh, they were probably about 50 to, no, not even 50. They were further out, about 80 yards away. And they never even put their heads up. And, you know, I figured the rain's downing the scent. And uh, I know unless the uh, thermals are strong, I think that's, that would be about the only time you could probably get close to a, a bowl you know, or, the, I, yeah, I, the, I think that's a scent explosion, you know, when everything comes to life and the ground smelling and the leaves are smelling. I think that's just a scent explosion. I think you're right. 100%. Yeah. yeah and I, it, and it does seem to knock that, that scent down. Right. Yeah. I think the scent is knocked down. It's grounded for some reason well, for a while. Right. Yeah. And it, it just, uh, you got to think about the fact though, that it, doing a lot of things it's cooling you down it's wetting everything on the outside it's it's uh it's actually filling in the molecules on your clothes and and it's actually holding more scent in on you mm -hmm. than what it's letting out so there's a lot of positive things about that and the everything around that animal and that animal gets that's uh gets wet and a drizzle is just one of the perfect times yeah to get i can remember uh killing a six by six yeah in a in a drizzle and I can remember another time having a, a an elk herd go right by me on either side, and no reaction at all from the. And as a matter of fact, a couple of spikes turned and, and looked at me and kept walking, and I was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> yeah. But that was yeah, I, that was I've a little drizzle too. Yeah, I've seen the same thing. I, how, like I was telling you guys earlier, you know, I, my experience this year with the ozone stuff was was exquisite. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be buying one. I mean, um, it made me a believer. Well, those deer didn't stay around for 40 seconds. They stayed around for 40 minutes. Right. Right. Wow. Right. So, and, and it wasn't just me in the blind. I had another, I had, I was guiding somebody, um, the infamous Bruce Gaynor and, uh, we call him chicken wire down here. Uh, <laughs> but, at, but at the end of the day, I, I was so impressed with, I'm going, man, any minute. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about a good wind now, not right. a little bitty wind. I'm, I'm like, any minute they're going to blow us up, you know, and this is going to be over with. No. Well, but but you bring up another. Off to get down. You bring up another point, though, that people have to think about is that, I don't know if you've ever seen water go around rocks in a river. Sure. But when you have water rushing by, that that water will rush and as it goes around on the back side of something it creates what we call an eddy it actually sweeps back on in and stays mm -hmm. in on itself while the outer layers keep on going and sometimes when you're in a blind like that uh and that air is <clears throat> going around that blind it actually comes and creates like that eddy effect so uh yeah you, you're not buying it huh? <laughs> no buddy let me tell you something those deer were on i mean they walked within three feet of us joe yeah that's so impressive. That, I, i'm telling you it's super impressive not right if you'd have been sitting in that blind with me you'd have been like i'm buying one tomorrow right yeah. i mean it is unbelievable well, I, how, I have one like works. i said and uh I, i've had a chance to put some stuff in it and i will tell you guys if you're going to put anything in that bag the thing i recommend for you to put in is your hat um oh, yeah, because sure. face most, mask hat most hunters they wear that same hat every day all day all over the place and uh you know i can i can take i have two daughters uh that are full, they're grown now but when they were smaller one time i told my wife i said i can tell each of you from the smell of your head they had a different smell that yeah that yeah, uh for sure and and they didn't believe me and i sure enough i they blindfolded me and, and 
<laughs> you you have that scent on the top yeah. of your head and yeah. i mean we sweat and all of the heat goes out of the top of our heads so mm-hmm. even though a hat kind of helps to keep that in when you wear it uh it, it can become yeah just take your hat off and smell it <laughs> not, you know, Joe, I bring, you know, my OCD kicks in when I'm hunting. I don't have much OCD in my life other than when I'm hunting and fishing, but I, I bring four or five different hats, you yeah. know, to go with right. the different camo outfit I might be wearing for that day. But right. at the end of the day, the most important thing is for me to let that hat breathe, you know, and, and right. get that scent off of it. Cause I'm yeah. going to look like y'all know, I mean, my fat butt, it, I sweat. You know, it don't, it could be 30 degrees out there, 25 degrees, and I ain't a quarter mile from camp and I'm already going at it, right? You so. know, and I, I tell a lot of people that too, you know, if you wear a, a layer of clothes, a shirt or breeches or something, find you a nice fir tree where, you know, those limbs yeah. are out in the sun, hang those up, out up yeah. there and, and that sunlight will burn off that scent as well and that it'll air it out and uh, that's a good yeah. way to get those clothes yeah out. when you come to our camp it looks like you know everybody's got their <laughs> wash out on the line i mean yeah. it's it's true we, we're hanging it up everywhere and you know everybody's got the camo out it's it's uh but it works it right works right right sure. joe um, what about washing machine products i mean there's a lot of products out there now do you use some of the stuff in your washing machine too to to wash your camo and there's a lot of them that don't have uv brighteners in it and stuff like that doggone straight I, yeah. I, you know um it, what i even still with that i still throw in baking soda in with it it's just uh it's an it's a old habit hard right. for me to break i believe in baking soda um it doesn't do anything uv wise to your clothes and uh you know they have so many of those detergents now that that do that i do tell people though because uh you know, my camo, I buy a lot of cotton stuff and, and things like that. Yeah. So I always turn my camo inside out to wash it and dry it uh, to help keep my patterns on as long as possible. Because, you know, once that pattern starts to go, you need to pass that off or use it for sleeping in or something because you don't want to sure. hunt in it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, and the shower products that you use, Joe, are they pretty much over the counter that you can buy? The HS scent stuff, use bar soap and the liquid. I mean, I buy an all in one. It's like a liquid gel. You can you can use for shampoo and mm-hmm. for, for your body wash. I know exactly like what you have because we right. have that shower set up at camp. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we got a little shower tent set up there and, uh, yes, and that thing is a lifesaver. Yeah. I mean, like, like we could forget a lot of stuff, but we ain't forgetting that. Right. Yeah. And you know, everybody that has all of their, has all their soaps up in there and stuff. And, you know, everybody yeah. use, you know, there's people using, uh, hunter specialties, dead down wind and, you know, uh, a lot of different stuff yeah. out there. There's and, a lot of, a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's great it's for the hair, good. everything. And I, I, another, uh, thing that I do and that my wife kind of taught me uh you know those cling free sheets I mean if you wash yes, your clothes sir. don't throw one in there <laughs> it'll, yeah, it'll, no, it'll no, smell no, like yeah. banana but what you can do yeah when you dry them for sure right but what you can do is, is roll up some tin foil into a ball and throw it in there and you won't have the staticky cling and now, your clothes now they're making the scent free they're making a lot of scent free uh, oh, sheets uh, uh, sheets now and they actually make one that smells like dirt you yeah put it in there and make yeah i've tried that smell like dirt. don't be putting mm-hmm. no dirt in your clothes now <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i, I my think, wife's like don't be putting nothing in my dryer unless a cat pack comes by me first because you'd be tearing my dryer up <laughs> right yeah and For and sure. i would tell you the the you know that's what's kind of good about those ozone bags and <clears throat> you got to be careful of what you put in them because ozone breaks down plastics and rubbers. For sure. And yeah. so you got to be careful what you put in there. Uh, I'm not sure what it does to polyesters and stuff if you just keep using it. But, you know, that could break it down. And we know a washing machine can break certain things down. But uh, the washing machine is a little harder on the cotton, which would be better in an ozone bag because you don't have to wash it as much and it's still killing that bacteria. So there's a way of using those two things to get a little more life out of your products there so that they live longer. Okay. Um, For sure. Let's well, move uh, along. Moving along. Uh, <laughs> when you're moving through the woods, Joe, you know, in your hunting strategies, what is, a, what is kind of the main thing that you look for? you know, when you're moving through the woods, are you using a wind checker or do you, a lot of guys put a little feather on their bow that's got a little string on it so they can see the wind. I mean, 
you know, you can tiger woods it and throw the, throw the grass up in there. But <laughs> for me, for, for me, I, I use a wind checker all the time and, you know, it's got a little bit of talcum powder, non-scented talcum powder. And, you know, we constantly checking that thing. I mean, I, I don't know, I, you know, I, I move slow anyway, slow is my fast. So at the end of the day, I'm constantly checking that wind. You know, it, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, I keep two of those checkers with me yeah. in case I lose one because, uh, mm -hmm. again, you're not going to be successful on your hunt if you're not paying attention to the wind. So a wind checker, you know, I know people that hang feathers. I'm not smart enough to do that on my bow. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting there watching it trying to figure out. But yeah, which I, way it's going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Especially when it goes one way and then it goes the end. Next yeah. Way it's like, it's you know, like, wow. so I, I rather I'd rather be able to put it out there and actually see how those because you can watch how those thermals flow away from you off of that. And, and I really like to see that. So that's something that I use now. You just use a little snuffer bottle. Yeah. Yeah, I, in fact, it's not that little. It's because uh, I don't want to run out of it while I'm out there. It's a little sure, bigger, sure. but um, it fits in my pocket. You know, there's only so many things that I keep in my pockets, you know, that I drop in my pack that's reachable, and that's one of them, you know. For sure. um, I don't like to wear binos on me, uh, yeah, so I like to keep them on, on my hip if possible, or I will, if I, I have some small ones, I can slip through so that they're held up here on the top and being held by my, uh, my shoulder strap. But I, I don't want anything here because, I, you know, RC Knox, <laughs> one of those stories, <laughs> sure. you know, RC had a beautiful yeah. bull in front of him and had his just, and they weren't big binos that had them right there pulled back and yeah. took a shot. And man, it, uh, that string caught his binos on there and about blew everything up so i don't like to wear anything there so those are some of the things i like I to keep I, I have my calls handy i got my wind checker handy and i got a small pair of binos handy and so i keep everything else off of me but when i'm moving through the woods gilbert you know you're you're wanting to get to an area you're always not going to have the wind right and you're not going to have the thermals right so there's things that you can do, like if you're working up a ridge and you want to hear what's talking on the other side of that ridge, well, and it's early, you, you can pretty much stay without getting to the one side where your thermals are now going down on that side. You can kind of stay over towards the opposite side and do your calling to get an idea. Then from where you get your answer determines whether you're going to go up that ridge or you're going to go down that ridge to circle around. Um, if I want to get to an area and I got a wind going right at my back, you know, because there's a, a lot of times on state land, you've got boundaries of where you can hunt. And so if I'm wanting to go through an area, but the wind's not right for me, why well, I drop down lower, get the wind at my back, and I go right with the wind right at my back. Now, I might not see anything in front of me, but I can do some calling and still hear things on the side. And now if that thing is up on the side, now I have a parallel wind that I'm able to work into it. So, you know, I've had guys that have been hunting with me and they're like, dude, this guy ain't that bright. <laughs> he, 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 he's hunting with the wind at his back the whole time and yeah. uh no that's not you know, it's, the case. The, it's the stuff off the peripheral that you're hunting though joe exactly you know mm -hmm. and and that's what people don't it's okay to have the wind at your back if you're hunting a, a ridge that you know everything's going to be up the ridge or down the ridge depending on what which way the wind's going but I, I get what you're saying, you know, paramount to use the wind, but sometimes you have to, you know, side yeah. hill the wind or, or you get the wind at your back just because you're going to go in the direction where you know this next ridge you're going to talk. You may have to go around so we don't have the wind at our back. Well, and that's another back. thing to remember, too, is that wind – can be at your back while you're on the side of the ridge but by the time you get down into that drainage yeah, that wind face. is running straight down that drainage so yeah. just because you've got wind on you at your back doesn't mean that if you have an animal out there 200 yards that animal has that wind coming straight to them yeah you know it's a blessing and a curse for me a lot of times when i hit my snuffer bottle and the wind just swirls right right and it moves around 
So I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> well, I mean, you don't know whether to come here or sick them. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, you you don't know what to do. So right. for me, for me, I just, I got to understand that's the same way that's happening for that elk too. He's not getting the full, the full meal deal all the time. So right. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and do what I got to do to get to him, especially if I've got him talking. Right. And, uh, and I know where he's going to be. So the most important thing about that Gilbert is, when you have kind of the wind doing that is to be more thermal based. If you've got a, if you've got a cooler day and that wind's kind of doing it, then you want to get on the down, you know, either level with that animal, you know, or a little bit below him. Um, and if, if it's warmer and that's starting to rise up, well, then you want to work that wind differently. So if, if your wind isn't doing too much, you got to go thermal based uh, because you know it's kind of funny it's like um if if the thermals are it's a, a bending thing if the thermals are coming down and has a wind hitting it well it kind of bends that pushing it to a direction it just doesn't carry it directly it just kind of bends it so um you know you have to consider that so you want to be below if it's coming down you want to be above or right at it i love a parallel wind and yeah, for sure. if i have a parallel wind that gives me an opportunity uh, as a caller to do a few things. And as a solo hunter, it gives me a, a, a chance to do a few different things. And uh, that kind of works into what we were going to talk about setting up and thinking about the wind if I'm a solo hunter. So, yes, yeah, there's a difference between being a solo or, or hunting with partners. Oh, the, it's a, you set up. Yeah. You know, the partner thing's sweet. And it's, it's, it's the easiest to figure out because – you know, every now and then you have that critter that just comes straight at you, you know, but it doesn't happen very often. And that's like on this last hunt and uh, this 2018 hunt, when I was trying to bring that big bull by Chav, you know, I could hear, and I've got Chav up in front of me, and I automatically, I hear that bull starting to circle to that downwind side. So Chav's fine where he's at. You know, he had already set up a little bit off to the to the downwind side, but that bull was dropping even more. So I just started, uh, just rotated. I just kind of rotated away. If if you put us on a record, and that elk is coming down this way, I started doing this, going the opposite, so that I started pulling him straight through to Chav because now my straight line to that animal has got a little bit of a, a half circle on it. So I was able to work that animal and make sure that he didn't scent chap. In fact, I ended up getting that bull. Yeah. Went between us. Yeah. <laughs> but I had a shot. Yeah. Or I had an opportunity that wasn't quite ready for it. So when, when the story goes with that is that I worked so much to bring him by him I'm up on the side of a ridge and I had called, now I'm raking a tree and I have my bow at my feet and I'm thinking, I'm not even considering the bull coming to me because I'm figuring he's trying to loop around, you know, that area where Chav was. And once he gets downwind and comes by him, he's going to catch a scent line. He's going to be gone. Well, by me rotating around, I actually brought him, he cut in front of Chav so that Chav was below his scent line and <laughs> had a malfunction yeah <laughs> malfunction <laughs> so so I've been there <laughs> yeah we should we would probably do a whole podcast on <laughs> malfunction, malfunction. <laughs> <laughs> but it that bull ends up walking by him at 30 yards i'm getting ready to start raking and i look down and i catch movement and here he's coming up to me so you know it was one of those situations that he actually looped and he he came straighter towards that rake than he did a call. And that's something for people to, mm -hmm. to remember as well. You know, he, he was not as leery coming into the rake as he was a call. And I'm not sure why that is, but it's just in the back of my mind. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with a partner, it's a whole, whole different deal. As a solo hunter, when I'm calling that animal, I still like to get that wind parallel so that when I'm kind of coming in, not in my face, because if it's in my face, he's got to work hard to try to get around me. 
if that wind is parallel, and I've set up what I, I, I like a flexible grunt tube. I don't like a straight grunt tube. I like a flexible one because I have it behind me and I am, I'm throwing those sounds. I'm throwing whatever cow calls or something off below me downwind. Yep. So if I'm, if I'm parallel with that and throwing those sounds downwind, that animal, even if he tries to loop a little bit, is going to come right towards me or right past my shooting lane. So that's something I like to think about and understand that anybody out there, yeah, it's great to have partner hunting, but I've killed every elk I've killed as a solo hunter. I've called them all in for myself. So uh, it can be done. It can be done well. You just got to really think about that wind and think about those thermals and, and work so that they don't have to work as hard to circle around. Yeah, I remember. I remember Chav and I were up above some elk one one eve or one morning, and it had been raining uh, that morning. And we went ahead and went on up. We heard a bull up top, and we started going up. And uh, I actually we had a parallel wind. The wind wasn't necessarily in our face. It was actually going down, going down mm -hmm. the mountain. We're coming up, the, coming up right. the mountain, and it's going down this way. And uh, he said, well, why don't you go ahead and call? And uh, I bugled, but I bugled behind me with my tube, like right. you're talking about. I bugled behind me, and, man, we had two or three bulls light up right in front of us. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And then I cow called a couple times, and, man, you could hear him. He's coming, like running, right, right. going nuts. He's coming right to us. And uh, that bull actually walked within 12 yards, well, probably less than 12 yards of us. But he never looked towards us because I kept – I kept my bugle behind me all the time and, and right. down, down the hill. Right. So exactly. he was looking for bulls down there. And then the perfect storm happened. Another bull came from that direction and he saw him. So he had no clue we were even there at all. He almost stepped on Chav to get around him. And uh, I, that was an amazing hunt. But again, wind was parallel. Wasn't just in right. our face. So, that, let, uh, going back to the flexible grunt tube as a solo hunter, I have that and it's wrapped on me naturally, which is keeping that front end of that call right here where I can just go down this much and I can make a call without making a lot of movement. And then that sound is being sent back behind me. And now I can just real easily because of that string on here, I just push down on that and it's right at my side and I'm clear to draw. And I haven't mm -hmm. hardly made any motion at all. Yeah. And I will tell you though, the time you want, there is a it's time you want fantastic. the wind in your face. And the time you want the wind in your face is if you're stalking a bull, moving in on one silently, because now you've got a whole better situation. Sure. Yeah. So that's, uh, no That's doubt. pretty much no on doubt. the strategies that I use, buddy. Well, and, and you know, the last few years we've been hunting with partners and right. I'm telling you, I, I like it. I like it better than solo hunting. I mean, I don't mind being out there by myself, but boy, I'm telling you, if I can call and have another guy post it up and or both of us call, man, it's, it's dangerous. It's a that's dangerous the, situation. For that's that the area. optimum yeah, situation. You got, you got twice as much. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Very much so. Um, anything else you guys can think about on, on scent? No, no, you know what I tell you, you what know, is, I, I think we did help. a good job. I think we're on good time right here. And uh, what I'd like to say is that, you know, all you guys listening out there, understand something that, uh, man, if there's been any mistake that could be made, I've made it. If, if you're right. new to this, mm -hmm. you, you got to remember a lot of this stuff is in my database and there's, there's a lot of, there's stuff I know that I've probably forgotten. So, um, I, I try to give it to you as basic as possible, but if you have any question, all you got to do is email it to us at info at elkbros.com. We'd love to have our viewers' questions. Please go and check out our Blue Collar Elk Hunting podcast on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. Go to our YouTube. Go to our uh, elkbros.com site that went live today. It's live. Now, we have the Elk Academy still under development, but, you know, we're really excited. Our webpage is up. It looks it's awesome. fantastic. And 
yeah, I'm uh, real happy with that. So, yeah, great job with that. So uh, we need you guys. Please rate us. Um, please send reviews on us. That's the name of the game for us to understand you as our audience and how we um, can help you. Yeah, and how we can help you. You ask, and we will deliver. And you know, uh, all you gotta do is ask Gilbert. Ask Manano, ask Luis, um, ask any of the guys that I've guided over all these years that, uh, you know, uh, we're coaches, we're teachers, we are your personal elk coaches. And even though, you know, we're going to tell you you need to get out there and work hard and you got to put into it, ask the questions and we will help you. We'll be there for you. Joe, I sure appreciate it, man. This was a fantastic episode. Uh, they're not gonna, they're not gonna want to miss next week's. It's gonna be fantastic. The content just keeps getting better. We launched the web page. Uh, it's been awesome uh, talking about scent and how we set up and use the thermals. I think thermals are a big deal. A lot of guys don't know exactly what we're talking about when we talk about thermals. So, all of that's been fantastic. Uh, I want to thank you and Chav and our listeners for being with us tonight and uh, look forward to having everybody back at Elk Camp next week. Y'all come back and join us next week, and we'll have another fine show for you. Next time, brother. Next time. Sign up.